Hi there, Smart Drivers talking tonight about smarter defensive driving, how to keep yourself safe, especially right now during the summertime, which when most fatal crashes occur and occur on, sun, on sunny days, dry roads, moderate traffic, and not on interstates or in the cities as many people are mistakenly think uh, happen on two lane highways. Uh, two lane skinnies as they're called in the trucking industry, tertiary and secondary roads, which means back roads. Uh, is where most fatal crashes occur. As I've said before, and we've talked about in defensive driving, uh, most fatal crashes, three times the number of fatal crashes happen in rural areas. So uh, reasons for that, higher speeds, uh, longer access to emergency facilities, uh, emergency crews have to get to you, have to administer help, uh, you know, life resuscitating help and whatnot and then they have to get you to an emergency facility uh, sometimes that's helicopters uh, ambulance or whatnot but there are reasons why most of these crashes are fatal so happy fourth of july for all the americans our american friends down south there all the best uh some people here already bricks for wheels Corey is the moderator uh elevator fan tuning in from monticello indiana stefan is here hello my friend and pierce is here so we've got a few people here already uh, if you're tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from, what class of license you're going for, uh, and anything else that we can help you out with being a smart, safer, smarter driver or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. We can help you with all of that. So let us know down in the comments how we can help you out. And again, happy Independence Day uh, there in the States. Uh, using a backup camera driver's test. Uh, Michael, yes, you can use a backup camera. You just can't use it as your primary line of sight for the purposes of your driver's test. You can look at the backup camera, look at your mirrors, but you do need to be looking out through the back window. And this is the same for all lower 48 states and the 10 provinces in Canada. Defeli, uh, how to stay safe on the freeway. Uh, I just got my driver's license 16 and been having it for a month. Thank you. Yes, we can help you with that. Definitely space management. Aaron, uh, while that's surprising, rural areas more crashes is probably because of high speed limits. I heard a few rural areas has uh, speed limits from 55 to 65. Uh, Amazon, Aaron, okay, it's not more crashes. There are definitely more crashes in rural areas. There are more fatal crashes in rural areas. That's what you need to keep in mind. More fatal crashes in rural areas. That's what you need to uh, keep in mind. My friend Marion is here. Uh, yeah. Uh, Marion, unfortunately, I got it up a little bit late. Uh, I was thinking that I wasn't going to do it today because it's 4th of July in the States. And uh, then I thought, oh, I'll just do it and then uh, we can move forward with the week. So we're here. Uh, Stefan, I want to try for my G1 and you can definitely do that and you will be successful, my friend. Um, Pierce, how many chances during road tests if you failed your test? Uh, you can take your driver's test as many times as you can until you pass, my friend. So... Uh, Shaba, hi from Calgary. Hello, my friend Sheldon. I have a road test next week, Friday. Any tips that I need to know? Yes, we will definitely give you tips to be successful on passing your driver's test. So you want to talk about safer defensive driving. I want to talk about the misconceptions around driving. Many people believe that winter driving is the highest number of crashes uh, during the year, which is mistaken. It's not correct. <laughs> it's the toughest driving conditions for sure. But it's not what produces the most number of crashes. The most number of crashes happen right now. June, July, and August in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, these are the 100 uh, most fatal days for crashes. So keep that in mind when you're driving. Uh, higher possibility of being involved in a crash at night. But there are still the same number of crashes. So know that. And I can also give you more research information on this. The, the country of Australia has one of the highest uh traffic safety campaigns are not one of the most highest one of the most vigorous traffic safety campaigns in the world i would argue probably in the world yet they still have one of the highest crash rates in the world and nobody else in the rest of the world is pointing at australia going look look at what their traffic uh, safety campaign is doing look at how it's reducing crashes and as well they have the highest number of speed cameras and red light cameras uh so much so that it affects the culture of driving in that country nobody speeds everybody does 62 miles an hour 100 kilometers an hour because of speed cameras therefore 
They have good weather most of the time. They have a very high percentage of rural roads because, you know, most of the population lives on the Boomerang Coast from Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide. That's where 75% of the population in Australia lives. It's, uh, think of it, uh, comparable to Canada. 75% of the Canadian population lives along the 49th parallel. It's the same thing in Australia. So lots of rural roads. Uh, Marion, I saw on Global News tonight that ICBC is shortening the road test from 45 minutes to 35 minutes. Uh, they're dropping the parking maneuvers. Awesome. <laughs> more, more stupid bureaucrats. And I am just going to say that out loud because it is true. They are following the lead of Ontario who has dropped the parking maneuvers. If they actually wanted to test people, they would actually leave the mark parking maneuvers in and get rid of the stupid on-road thing. Because I have seen so many drivers. You, Any monkey can drive a car down the road in a straight line. But slow speed maneuvers? No. People can't do that. Uh... Can you do a quick summary of the process of getting a motorcycle license? Yes, I can do that for you. Remind me after the presentation, I'll do that for you. Uh, definitely. Uh, Amazon, Aaron, in California, you only get three attempts to do your driver's test. And then, Aaron, what happens after the third attempt? They can't just say, no, you can't ever get a driver's license. Obviously, uh, is there a waiting period or something? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think it's just three attempts. Uh, retired. Hello, my friend. Malik, how do I stop uh, swerving when trying to change lanes? Okay, uh, we can go over that as well after the presentation. Uh, guys, that's my question to the host of this channel. What is your hope? Oh, uh, how can I get my TLC and how much will it cost? Uh, TLC, which, uh, what does TLC mean, my friend? Not familiar with that acronym. And I just want to make sure I have the right acronym. I mean, I could guess, but just let me know. Great head, I want to try for my G1. Okay, so we got all of that going on. All right, so let's get over to the slideshow presentation because there's a lot that I want to get through tonight. Uh, I want to clear up some myths and misconceptions about driving and when you are in danger of being involved in a crash, all right? Uh, elevator fan, left lane squatters can cause crashes. Yes, they can. And uh, just talk to Tracy, my girlfriend, about left lane squatters. And, you know, the cars are just piled up behind them and they're refusing to get over... And it just, you know, it drives me crazy too. It's one of my one of my pet peeves, as you know, if you've been here on the channel for any length of time with me. All right, so slideshow presentation, let's get through that. Uh, smarter defensive driving, talking about minimum safe distance. If you double your current following distance, you are going to be a safer, smarter driver. The one thing that you need to do to reduce your chances of being involved in a crash, and the reason that I say that is the number one reported crash in the United States of America even more so than windshield damage, okay? And everybody that has collision on their cars can get their windshield replaced uh, under their insurance because of uh, part of the collision insurance is windshield replacement. So even more than chips on your windshield and getting your windshield replaced is rear end crashes. It's the number one reported insurance claim crash in the United States of America, which means that people are following too close. And I can tell you that from my personal experience of driving, that people cannot stop and react fast enough unless you create more space between you and other vehicles on the roadway. As I say time and time again, if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. Sorry, uh, there we go. Uh, it's these goofy controls. They've changed my software on me and I still cannot get used to it. There we go. Okay. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s, hauling freight between Ontario, Canada, and the United States. I drove buses for Greyhound and the regional bus line in Australia while I was going to university there. Became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1998. Graduated with my doctorate in legal history from the University of Melbourne, Australia in 2006. Uh, for those of you who may or may not know, uh, legal history is a study of policing prisons and courts and my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic oddly enough and how traffic changed policing so that it moved forward out of its working class roots if you want to know more about me uh, you can check out the autobiography over at the smart drive test website 
All right, good stuff to have a look at. Look at the podcast over at the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, you can look at that down in the description there and get the link to the podcast. And as well, for new drivers, I did put up a video on the weekend on new drivers and defensive driving. What are you up against after you get your license? How can you keep yourself safe? All right. What is driving? Driving is both an art and a science. And there are a couple of simple things that you can do to keep yourself safe because you are at risk of being involved in a crash. You have to observe correctly. You have to understand what other drivers are doing. Read and glean information from traffic signs, from road markings. Uh, observe traffic patterns. Understand the configuration of different cars and road users and how that is going to affect traffic and how it is going to affect how you respond if you are following too close and you are too close to the traffic and road users in front of you you are reacting you're giving up your power of your vehicle if you have enough space on the other hand you are now responding because space gives you time time gives you options and options prevent crashes let me say that again everyone is always saying we never have enough time we never have enough time in traffic and in driving, you can have more time. You create more space, you have more time. Time creates options and options reduce crashes because it is always faster to steer out of an emergency situation than it is to brake and hope that you're gonna get your vehicle stopped in time. So create space around your vehicle. The other piece about this in terms of art and science is, is that many people think that if they get up close to the bumper in front of them, that they're gonna move more vehicles through the intersection. It is quite the opposite. It's the same thing about the myth of when the most number of crashes happen. Most people are convinced, without a doubt, in their mind and have the opinion that the most number of crashes happen in the winter time. It doesn't happen in the winter time. It happens at this time of year, June, July, and August. All right, we have rudimentary communication when we're driving, we have uh, nose to tail, bonnet to boot sort of driving that we're looking at the back end of the vehicle in front of us and we do not communicate well. Think of it of standing in a grocery store line. You don't talk to the person in front of them because you're looking at their backside, okay? It's the same thing in traffic. Scope three, all right? What is the problem of driving? This is something that defensive driving models never ever talk about. They never talk about what is the problem of driving. They, talk, they give you all kinds of things that you can do when you're driving to reduce your chances of being involved in a crash, but they never stop to define what the problem of driving is. The problem of driving is social driving. It's the way that people drive after they get their license. They follow too close. They don't come to a complete stop at stop sign intersections. They speed. They fail to give the right of way. And on and on and on and on. And I can list so many hallmarks of social driving. The four tools that you want to put in place are speed management, observation, communication and uh, communication. So the four tools, space management, speed management, communication and observation. I think I missed one there. But anyway, those are your four tools of smarter defensive driving. You want to create space around your vehicle so that you have a living room. You can always, always manage the space in front of your vehicle. Okay, people will say to you, oh, somebody's going to cut in if I leave space there. That is Yes, once or twice people will move into that space, but for the most part, they will not. We get into crashes, we hit things because we're too close to the vehicles around you. As I said previously here, space buys you time, time buys you options, and options prevent collisions. All right, stay back one vehicle length when you're stopped in traffic, when you're moving slow. It gives you several options when you do this, because this is what we're talking about in terms of creating and managing space around your vehicle. It's a safeguard against being rear-ended when you're sitting in traffic. You can move out and around the vehicles in front of you if it breaks down or if you change your mind about the direction that you want to go. If the person in front of you is driving a manual transmission as they are in Europe and other places in the world, if the car rolls backwards, it's not going to roll into you. And in an ideal utopic world that I envision for all of us to be safer, happier, smarter drivers, that... If we all stayed back one vehicle length, the whole pack of vehicles could move off together and we would reduce traffic congestion. <laughs> However, we all it's important that we all cling to our illusions and I definitely have mine, okay? When you're driving on the two lane skinny roads and I have a video that I'm putting together and hopefully I'll get it up for tomorrow for you, 
Control the space in front of your vehicle. Drive between the clusters of vehicles on the highway, on the roadway, on the freeway, the parkway, wherever you are. You can always create that space in front. You want to stay out of the clusters because the clusters, the vehicles, the drivers are too close to one another. And if something happens, something's going to happen to all of the vehicles in that cluster. However, this is not the place, the interstate, the freeway, where most fatal crashes happen. The reason for that is because they've eliminated many of the hazards that lead to traffic crashes, i.e. intersections, i.e. opposing lanes of traffic where uh, vehicles are traveling at 60 miles an hour in opposite directions. Uh, there's no slow speed maneuver or slow speed vehicles. There's no bicycles. There's no farm machinery, no industrial machinery. There's no uh, bicycles. Okay. Everybody is doing the same speed and going in the same direction. And most highways and freeways, interstates and freeways now rather have a barrier down the center. So it's uh, more or less eliminated head on collisions on interstates and freeways. Who's driving? Following too close. As I said, if you're following too close, you're hoping on a wing and a prayer uh, that you can react in time to the traffic in front that you can get your vehicle stopped. We don't want to react. We want to create enough space that we can respond to what's going on in front of us. And as well, more space allows us to be predictable on the roadways. But social pressure is real and we succumb to that social pressure when we when we're driving. We want to fit in. We don't want other people honking at us and telling us that we're number one and screaming as they're going by because we're doing something that they don't like. We've offended their sense of right and wrong on the roadway. So according to the culture of driving, it dictates to us with very strong social pressure that we must follow too close and we must speed and we must keep up with the pack. That herd mentality. You have to resist that to be a safer, smarter driver and keep yourself safe when you're driving. Okay, predict traffic patterns, looking ahead, looking and identifying intersections, turning lanes, looking for rubberneckers, just have an emergency vehicle on the side of the road attending to a crash and whatnot and just see the number of rubberneckers. The entire pack of traffic is going to slow down. It's as predictable as buying a Big Mac at McDonald's. The traffic is going to slow down and there are going to be rubberneckers at a crash scene or if a police officer has somebody pulled over on the side of the road. Okay, know the characteristics of vehicles. Fully loaded semi-trucks, logging trucks, they're going to slow down going uphill. Motorcycles, okay. Uh, faster acceleration, faster braking, more aggressive, moving into turning, uh, changing lanes and those types of things. All right, so know that this is also the time of year of RVs and camper trailers and those doing 10, 15 miles an hour less than what the traffic flow is out on the highways and roadways and whatnot. And they're going to have a cluster of vehicles bunched up behind them. So these are all characteristics and traffic patterns. Okay, interpret the actions of individual road users. Okay, construction zones, get rid of zipper merging. Do not zipper merge, okay? As soon as you see the construction signs, merge over. Do not wait to the choke point, okay? The choke point is the intersection. It is a danger zone, okay? When you see the signs to move over and merge, you should be on yellow alert. You should start moving over. If you get to that choke point and you have to merge, you should be on red alert because you are in danger, at that choke point. Interpret vehicles movements, paying attention to your own driving and creating and maintaining and being vigilant about that space margin around your vehicle. All right, mapping and tracking road users at intersections, locating intersections. And every one of these cautionary signs indicates an intersection. And intersections just aren't those marked by signs driveways, uh, into tourist areas, gas, construction, restaurants, uh, camping, uh, camping parts. That's not what the word I'm looking for. You know, uh, tourist traps and centers and those types of things. All of these are places where people are going to be turning drive in theaters. All of these are intersections. Okay. Scan the intersection before you get there know what road users are at the intersection and how to respond accordingly. You may have to slow down. You may have to give up the right of way. You may have to slow down, uh, unexpected events. You may have to break and whatnot. All right. Good luck on your driver's test. And remember,
pick the best answer. Not necessarily the right answer. All right. Excellent. Uh, Big Mac Sam is here. Hello, my friend Big Mac Sam. My friend Tim is here from Drive Smart BC. Uh, if you are in the province of British Columbia and want to know anything about traffic safety, anything about traffic laws, uh, road maintenance, court cases that affect uh, traffic and whatnot, uh, policing and all of that, have a look at Drive Smart BC as well. There is a forum over there that you can participate in with other driving uh, experts and get information about that. So definitely check out Drive Smart BC if you are in the province of British Columbia. Uh, Jay Smith, camping parks. Are you looking for RV parks or campgrounds? And good evening, sir, and good evening to you as well. And thank you for helping me with that. RV parks, campgrounds, that's what I was all looking for. <laughs> what I was trying to say there. Uh, no need to worry about police patrols. If you follow the rules, they'll be too busy uh, with those that don't. Absolutely. Uh, police officers are definitely busy uh, this time of year, especially with long weekends and policing and holidays and all those types of things. So know that if you're following the rules, you know, not speeding, not doing anything goofy. And as Tim likes to say, the nail that sticks up is the nail that gets the hammer. Uh, you are going to be just fine with police and whatnot. Uh, elevator fan, I was told to either keep with traffic or get run over by when driving in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, elevator fan, I have an opportunity to go to Los Angeles. I have an opportunity to go to Chicago. And I am just going to go there and I'm going to show you that the smarter defensive driving model works. That people are not going to run over you. They will drive around you. Keep in mind, people have three choices. Other drivers have three choices. They can wait for you. They can crash into you. Or they can just go home. Okay? Insert expletive. <laughs> uh, Ray, it feels a lot different driving alone. I've only driven with someone else in the car. Yes, and that is one of the pieces about driving by yourself is that, yes, indeed, uh, it is very different. Uh, Pierce, uh, should drivers think fast while driving? Uh, Pierce, no, you shouldn't be thinking fast and reacting to what's going on in the driving environment. You should create enough space that you can have calm awareness about what's going on. You're looking down the roadway, you're figuring out where road users are, you're mapping and tracking, and you're predicting and interpreting the actions of other road users, and you're responding accordingly. Because as we say, right, we never have enough time. Never have enough time. However, if you create space, space gives you time, time gives you options, and now you can respond accordingly to what's going on in the driving environment. Blessed. <laughs> Uh, blessed, it's been almost a year since I've moved the live streams to Tuesday. It's been quite a while that they're on Tuesday, my friend. But how are you, my friend? Aloha. Uh, Lindsberg, uh, the person who I took driver's test who didn't with didn't give me proof of class card back. I retake tomorrow. What do I do? Uh, I don't know. Which, uh, which state are you in that you're retaking your driver's test tomorrow? Uh, Big Mac Sam, yes sir, it sounds like a war zone here in New York City. There, These fireworks are out of uh, hand here. It's 9.22 p.m. <laughs> well, at least you got fireworks, Big Mac Sam. Uh, we didn't get fireworks here because they had fireworks in Kelowna, which is a half an hour up the road, and somebody set the mountain on fire. So, whoopsie. <laughs> so, we didn't get fireworks this year. Uh, uh, Marion, except... Uh, when Coquitlam traffic maintenance people didn't have any signs far enough back to warn drivers so I was caught in the right lane at the merge point I was not amused yes uh, if traffic control people don't put up the signs that is definitely dangerous for sure my friend but we're happy to hear that you're okay uh, rain sounds uh, driving there's people without stuff on their minds uh, it's it's not really that it's like you shouldn't be completely absorbed in driving because that's simply not possible there are simply too many things that are required when we're driving but you need to have the calm awareness that you're able to assess what's going on around you and have situational awareness when you're driving and figuring out what's going on but the most important thing to keeping yourself safe is having that space in front of your vehicle as long as you have that space in front of your vehicle you're going to keep yourself safe because now you can have calm awareness. Not only that, you have a better viewpoint and a vantage point of what is going on and you can respond accordingly about what's going on. For example, many of us 
are on these back roads with trucks pulling camper vans and RVs and those types of things. And it is without a doubt that they're going to be driving 10 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour below the posted speed limit. Below the posted speed limit, not even the flow of traffic which is gonna drive you absolutely bonkers, it drives me bonkers, because if you can at least do the posted speed limit, quite frankly, you shouldn't be on the roadway, okay? If you can't do the posted speed limit, you shouldn't be on the, free, on the highway. That's my thinking. But, and then traffic builds up and backs up behind it, and it's not safe. So you need the calm awareness where you just take a deep breath, and you're like, oh yeah, it happened, so, you do what you got to do, right? You have the calm awareness with your driving and you just hang back and wait for the passing lane. Many of these uh, tertiary and secondary roads, every few miles are going to have a passing lane. So just wait for the passing lane. Uh, wait for the road markings to tell you that it's safe to pass and that you have enough room to pass, okay? That's what you need to do to keep yourself safe on these secondary and tertiary roads because this is where the campgrounds are, right? These are where the RV parks are. That's what they're looking for. Uh, Ray, the fireworks show I went to had a massive explosion at the end. I'm not sure if it was intentional or not, but it caused a lot of people to panic. <laughs> Whoops, the, the pyrotechnics uh, did something wrong there. Uh, Amy, uh, I go for my driving test here in Port Alberni on the 11th. Uh, i nervous on the test and the person's going to be with me. Uh, Amy, remember what you got to do. Take a deep breath take away the person's right to fail you. Nothing less, nothing more. That's all you have to do, right? Your job is to demonstrate to the examiner that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing traffic conditions. That's it. That's all you need to do, okay? Take a deep breath. Get the first five minutes right. After you get the first five minutes right, everything else is going to be golden, all right? Uh, Pierce, what can you do during a turn with curbs around the parking lot? And streets, how do you avoid curb hits? Uh, Pierce, uh, give it twice as much room as you think you need to. I'm, I'm thinking you're talking about uh, parking lots with curb stops. Is that what you're talking about when you pull into the parking lot and there's that little piece of cement thing that's there? Is, is that what you're talking about, my friend? Uh, elevator fan, can I change lanes to avoid a crash? Absolutely, that's what you need to do. Uh, if And that's the other piece about it is, is that First golden rule of driving is always have that space in front of your vehicle, right? Second is if you can and it's possible, you know, have that space out to the sides of your vehicle. That way you can change lanes. And it's the, uh, I haven't put the video up yet. Coming back from Calgary on the Trans Canada Highway, uh, the two lanes that I was on was ending. There was a single lane on the other side and I look forward and there's a car passing coming straight at me in my lane. I knew that there wasn't a car beside me, so I just pulled over into the other lane to avoid the head-on crash that was imminent <laughs> there and moving, uh, you know, coming at me. So I avoided the crash by moving into the other lane. So yes. Uh, Pierce, I stayed home on the 4th of July. I just published videos on YouTube. Awesome, my friend. Terrific. All right. Uh, who else? Okay, same as usual. I hope you're doing well. Awesome, that's great. And uh, blessed, the fit is still running well for you, I hope. Awesome, awesome. All right, so let's... Um, the curbs, the solid things on the sides. Okay, so the curbs on the side of the road. Yeah, you. That's. I would suggest that you go and do some slow speed maneuvers, my friend, so that you know where the passenger side of the vehicle is or you can get a sense of that because the issue with that is the passenger side of the vehicle is the second biggest blind area on your vehicle next to the rear of the vehicle. So it's hard to judge that. So what I would suggest is you get one of those, some of those one meter tall, three foot tall pylons delineators and work with those in a parking lot and drive up on the passenger side and you can figure out where that side of the vehicle is in relationship to fixed objects. Because as you and I know, curbs are like this high, right? So that's how you need to do that. You need to do that work with the slow speed maneuvers to figure out where your vehicle is in relation to other things, i.e. curb stops, okay? My friend Mallory is tuning in from Nova Scotia. Hello, Mallory. So glad you could make it. No worries about being late, my friend. Uh, Tim says sharing the road means that you cannot expect everyone to do at least the speed limit. Uh, yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, indeed. However, my personal opinion, this is not even a professional opinion. My personal opinion is, is that if you can't even do the speed limit, I mean, I understand farm equipment and industrial machines and those types of things. I understand all that. But RVs and camper trailers, trucks pulling camper trailers, no, that I disagree with. If you can't drive your RV 50 miles an hour, you shouldn't be on the road. I'm sorry. That's my personal opinion. Epic, happy 4th of July here from Easton, Pennsylvania. If you are on an older freeway, some of them have a stop line on the ramp uh, due to missing acceleration lane, never uh, one acceleration lane. Yes, so Epic is talking about in the United, in the United States, in Pennsylvania, New York's, uh, some of these are parkways, some of these are highways. They don't have acceleration lanes. <laughs> it's basically a place to get out onto the multi-lane road and you basically have to come to a stop. You have to look for a gap in traffic and you have to proceed. Now, the nice, the, the trade-off on that is it's not like the interstate where there's bumper to bumper traffic out on the roadway. So it's not as daunting as you might think there's actually room to get your, you know, there's going to be space on the roadway to get up to speed and whatnot. Uh, elevator fan, no bikes allowed on the interstate. Yes, no pedestrians, no farm equipment, no industrial machines, anything that is a slow, uh, slow moving vehicle. So any vehicle that is not capable of doing, I believe it's 40 miles an hour. Uh, they have to do at least 40 miles an hour to be able to go out onto the interstate. Otherwise, they're not allowed. Uh, Corey's put up the video for nine tips uh, to reduce fear and anxiety. Have a look at that if you have some trepidation and fear around driving. Uh, Tim says practice drivers often forget that uh, they were once learners too. Uh, you can't expect the learners to go faster than they are able. The same goes for seniors. They're just slowing down to be safe. Uh, unfortunately, Tim, when they're slowing down, they're not safe. Okay, when they're not keeping, when they're not doing at least the posted speed limit, they're not safe. They're just not safe. Uh, they're actually more of a danger on the roadway than people who are actually doing the speed limit. Uh, motivational. Uh, should you always drive 30 kilometers an hour to school zone even when school is out in the summertime? No. Uh, when the school speed zones only apply when school is in session. Okay, so summertime doesn't apply. Unless there are signs in and around the school area that says that school is in session. Uh, but that is rare and I can't say I've ever seen that. I have had uh, some smart drivers tell me that in some places, in some areas in the states, that they have summer school in session and that the speed zones uh, still apply. So, uh, so yes, okay. Yes, uh, Tim said 60 kilometers an hour on freeways here in British Columbia and 60 kilometers an hour is 40 miles an hour. So I believe it, that is uh, widespread throughout the United States. Uh, freeways and interstates, unless you're able to do 40 miles an hour, you're not allowed on the interstate. And the other piece of that is, uh, I know that there are some farm tractors that now do 40 kilometers an hour, 40 miles per hour, 60 kilometers an hour. However, I'm pretty sure that I would not be very comfortable <laughs> on a piece of machinery that does 40 miles an hour out on the interstate because I know how people drive on the interstate. I would not feel comfortable on that at all. Uh, Mary and I saw a sign yesterday that they had the school zone sign underneath. They said summer school. Okay, so uh, Tim, do you know the answer to that question? If they have a sign that says summer school, did do they in fact uh, are school speed zones in effect when summer school is in session? Is I don't know about that. I need to look that up. Uh, Rick, did you go to a driving school to learn how to drive, or did you learn from a family member or friends? Uh, Big Mac Sam. <laughs> Here's the interesting piece. Uh, I didn't take any driver training uh, through any driver training schools. I went to, I did my driving instructors. Uh, I had to go to school for that, for the car. And then I went and did a classroom session for the car. And uh, then I had to do courses here in British Columbia. But other than that, I did not go to driving school for my car license, for my straight truck license, for my semi truck license nor for my school bus license because I had, in Ontario they have a separate school bus license. However, for my school bus license, I did take an hour with the driving instructor before I went in for my driving test just to make sure that I had it all down. And of course, <laughs> like so many driving instructors, he said to me, oh, you probably need another four or five hours. And I was like, yeah, no, I don't. I'm going to go take my test. And then I passed, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's that's how I did it. 
All right, uh, Tom, hi, Rick from Red Hot Scots America Driving Academy. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the Smarter Driver community, my friend. Thank you for stopping in. Uh, Reese, happy 4th of July. If you're stuck in a multi-lane highway with traffic, uh, no space to switch lanes ever. If uh, you want to do, think of like I-95 in New York, okay. Uh, Tim, so new drivers are not safe and shouldn't be on the road. Can't discriminate by age, playing devil's advocate. Uh, okay, so yeah, no, awesome. Thank you for playing devil's advocate, Tim. But with new drivers, uh, I have a stick in the car. And if they're not getting up to posted speed limit, I whack them with the stick. I'm kidding, of course. I'm, I'm being totally facetious. I don't whack them with the stick. I, hit, I just hit them with my bare hand. No, I'm being weird. And uh, basically what I do, if they're not willing to get up to speed and they don't get up to speed when I tell them to, then I've made a mistake. And what I do is I take them back to the parking lot and I work with them in a parking lot until they are comfortable with the vehicle. And then I will move them into low density traffic in residential areas. I will not take them out into busy traffic if they are not able to drive the posted speed limit. And it's been a while since I've had a student that was not comfortable driving the posted speed limit. I can't say that I've ever had a student that's been uncomfortable driving the posted speed limit. Uh, especially when it comes to big trucks, uh, definitely get it up to speed. And I always tease them about it too because they think that they're being safe and driving below the posted speed limit and then I'll be sitting in the truck and I'll look out the window and be like, oh, hey, Granny! And they're like, what? what? What's going on? I'm like, yeah, I think Granny's passing us with her walker here. Can we go the posted speed limit, please? Can, can we get it going? Like, really? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Tim, or not Tim, sorry, Sam. Uh, have you had that experience with students that have difficulty getting the vehicle up to speed? Uh, elevator, I've seen other drivers wait in the middle of the intersection when waiting to turn left. I am one of them. Yeah, don't tell me that, Elder fan. You can't hang out here if you're one of those in the middle of the intersection people. We're not in the middle of the intersection people. We're at the edge of the intersection people. That's who we are. Because those people in the middle of the intersection, you're just looking to get in a crash. Okay? We're not looking to be in a crash here. We're looking to be safer, smarter drivers. We're wait at the edge of the intersection people. That's who we are. Uh, Epic, New Jersey used to have the six month waiting period after failing a driver's test and that was taken out in 2013. Uh, addition, uh, like PA, okay. So we were talking about that earlier and it kind of got lost in the comments because the, the comments got super busy because it's busy here. So maybe we can revisit that. Somebody can talk about that because somebody said two and then you had to wait a certain period of time. I know that they've brought that back here in British Columbia. However, uh, I don't know what the waiting period is. Uh, Amy, I'm so happy I came across your page and info. I think I can pass. I just hope the person is nice. How long is the driving uh, session? Uh, Amy, where in the world are you? Because uh, durations of driving tests vary. Uh, if you're in a large metropolitan city like Chicago or Dallas, Texas or Los Angeles or New York City, uh, it might be like 8 to 10 minutes. Other places, less populated, less busy places, uh, the driving test is going to be longer uh, however, as I said, it's going to, it's going to depend. I mean, some of the places here, I mean, they're usually about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. Uh, so it really depends on where you're taking your driver's test on how long your driving test is going to be. Okay. Uh, Tandy, I just failed due to not posted speed limit was coming back from 70 and continuous to 70 on my last turn, how to improve this. Uh, so basically you didn't know what the posted speed limit. Okay, so the way that you improve that is to practice in and around the test center where you're going to be taking your test. The other thing that you can do is hire a driving instructor and go out and do a mock test, okay? Everybody who's coming up for a test, if you haven't taken driver training, hire a driving instructor for one hour. They will take you out on the test route and they will give you feedback on your skills and abilities and those that you need to improve. So do that to be safe and to pass your driver's test first time and you don't get caught out with uh, speeding, which is something that we don't want to fail our driver's test on. Tim, all the best, my friend. Have a great night, my friend. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you for stopping in. Always, always great. 
Uh, what was the background noise? There was a plane flying over elevator fan, and I had the door cracked open so you can hear the, the noise in the background. <laughs> uh, Amy, you're in Port Alberni. Okay, I'm on the island. So, Amy, your driver's test is going to be approximately half an hour, okay? Are you taking your own car or are you going with a driving school? If you're taking your own car, make sure that you do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle. Check all the fluid levels under the hood, the engine oil, the brake, uh, the hydraulic brake, brake fluid, the radiator, windshield washer fluid, okay? Make sure that your lights all work, your blinkers, your brake lights. Uh, make sure that the doors open and close inside and out, uh, make sure that you have your registration, your insurance for the vehicle. Make sure that the seat belt on the passenger side works. Uh, make sure that you have the... Lost my train of thought there. You needed something else. <laughs> registration and insurance. I think I saw that. Yes, license plates. That's what I was going to say. Make sure you have a license plate on the front of the vehicle and you have a license plate on the rear of the vehicle. Very important, okay? Because if you're missing one, uh, especially in British Columbia, you're going to need both. And they will not take you out if you're missing one or the other. So have your license plates, all right? Uh, that's basically it. If you're taking your own vehicle, make sure you take it down. Get it vacuumed before you go because post-pandemic, you don't want it dirty and those types of things. First impressions, okay? Have a shower. Put on decent clothes. You know, show up 20 minutes before your driver's test. Check in. Uh, here in British Columbia, they are going to have an ICBC office. You're going to be able to go in, use the facilities. Uh, you know and go out and then when the driving examiner comes out the first thing they're going to do check the horn That's the other piece check the horn know how to turn on the defrost air conditioning at this time of year because you want to keep the examiner Comfortable know how to turn on the high beam headlights and know how to turn on the windshield wipers and uh, Work and squirt. Okay, the blades go And squirt You know put some liquid on the windshield in case you get some big bugs and you can uh, Get rid of those all right uh, Amy, my own my own car, my hubby will help me with all that. It's a Jeep, awesome, and you might get points for a Jeep, maybe not, but <laughs> all cool, you're gonna do fine, okay? So make sure you do that pre-trip inspection, make sure that everything's working because you don't wanna have a brake light out uh, and you'll be denied your driver's test because it's something that's really easy to fix. At least cross your fingers, we hope it's something really easy to fix. On most vehicles, it is something easy to fix. Uh, so have a look at that. Now, uh, the other piece, all of this, we're going crazy here tonight. It's very busy. I did get the book up on Amazon. Yay for me. I just haven't pushed it yet because I want to get it up on the website and I'm working on some things. I'm going to do a soft launch. Is that is that even a thing? It is. I mean, they do it on the movies and those sorts of things. But hey, why not? We'll do it here at Smart Drive Test. So tomorrow... I'll just drop the link in. It's there. You can do what you want with it. Uh, next week, hopefully next week, I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to do a launch. I'm going to do a promotion. I'm trying to get people to write me reviews of the book underneath, uh, and we'll get you going. But here, I did get it up on Amazon. It is there, okay? Driving Test Secrets. If you want to search it, it's there. I'm selling it for $10. I don't know what people think about the price of the book for $10. I think $10 is a pretty fair price for it. But it's there. I'll drop the link tomorrow. And then next week, I'll start pushing it and uh, making it available for people. All right. Uh, Colton, hey, Rick. Uh, people who use their phone for navigation should use the Bluetooth to hear when they need to turn or exit. If they want to listen to music while they drive, they should turn it down. Uh, Colton, yes, exactly. And uh, I have a phone holder. And I do strongly recommend that you get a phone holder for your vehicle. Uh, I went for years with using a phone holder for whatever reason and they're inexpensive they're less than $20 uh, they work really well uh, I'm, I'm dubious about the magnet ones I've seen them I had one it only lasted about a year and then the magnet faded out and it didn't work anymore now I have one that has a cradle in it and it has a button on the back of it that you just open it up now saying that and what uh, Colton just said is it hooks to the stereo via Bluetooth and you know most newer vehicles this is all going to do it automatically the buggy got an upgrade so it has Bluetooth and uh, as Colton was saying now the thing about music uh, in most newer vehicles is the audio from the navigation is going to lower it's called ducking <laughs> when you're creating videos it's called ducking 
the music actually gets lower and then you can hear the navigation over the music in your vehicle. So yes, exactly what Colton said there, that you want to use uh, Bluetooth, you want to connect it to your audio system in your vehicle, and then you can have an audio and a visual aid to help navigate when you're trying to find your way to different places and whatnot, especially places you haven't been before and whatnot. Uh, thank you, Mallory. Yes, it's there. Soft launch. Uh, don't buy it yet, Mallory, because there is going to be a promo, and I am looking forward to, in exchange for that promo, I'm hoping to get reviews and whatnot on the book. But we haven't done that yet because I got a couple other pieces I got to figure out. Uh, excellent, Marion. Awesome. Uh, maybe, Corey, you've got a couple of minutes. You can go and find the book or whatnot. But anyway, it's there. Okay, Jim Jones, how do I control my speed when I make a left or right turn because I'm having problems with that, Rick? Okay, Jim, you want to slow down before you get to the turn. You don't want to be slowing down while you're coming into the turn. So, right turns, general rule of thumb. This is very general. 10 to 12 miles an hour. On left-hand turns, it's going to depend on how big the intersection is. However, it's going to be kind of 15 to 25 miles an hour for left-hand turns. Now, when you start turning, this is you want to slow down before you start turning the vehicle. That way you don't have to manipulate the speed as you're going around corners. And the other piece about that is if you do it like this, when you come to the winter time or slippery conditions, you're not going to be turning and steering at the, you're not going to be braking and steering at the same time. When you get into slippery conditions, you can't do both at the same time. You can only do one or the other. You're either steering or you're braking. Okay? You can't do both. So it's better to learn that when you're first learning how to drive. So get the speed down and then look in the direction you want to go. You want to start turning the vehicle when your body is in line with the edge of the intersection. It's the same thing if you're making a left-hand turn. On multi-lane roads, you want to start turning one lane. So when your body is in line with the one lane prior to the lane that you're going to turn into. Okay, so if it's just a two lane road going in each direction, you want to turn when you're at the edge of the intersection. If it's two lanes, multi-lane, you want to wait till the next lane and then you start turning for a left hand turn. Okay, Corey will put up the videos on turning there and that will help you out, my friend. Uh, Chow Berry, I've uh, become a better driver the last two years with practice at night, rain, different roads. I feel more confident over time. And yes, practice exposure therapy, we've talked about this before. Driving in rain, driving at night, driving on different kinds of roads and whatnot. All right. All of that is going to help you out and keep you safe. And Corey's found the book. Put the link up there. Thank you for that, Corey. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Amy, and if anybody does go and buy the book and pay the $10, I thank you right now from the bottom of my heart. If you could leave me a review for the book, even better. That would be just absolutely tremendous because we're trying to get that out there. We're trying to help drivers to be safer smarter drivers and on that note of safer smarter drivers uh what i'm going to do uh corey's put up the title there for you too driving test secrets here you'll find the hidden skills and abilities that will guarantee you pass your driver's test first time awesome awesome uh, i want to just bear with me one sec here all right so let's start down here let's start here all right so transition so bear with me here okay so this is one of the polls i put up on the weekend what do you think is the most dangerous ball tires following too close sleepy drivers not wearing seat belts all right and most people 66 percent of respondents put sleepy drivers are the most dangerous <laughs> and again we come back to the statistic that the number one reported insurance crash in the united states of america is ding 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 rear end crashes and only nine percent of people said following too close is dangerous it was the lowest response next to bald tires and this is why the key component of the smarter defensive driving model is space management space in front of your vehicle not stopping too close to other traffic so this is actually in the reverse order of what it should be. So following too close is actually the most dangerous driving condition that you can have. All right, uh, this is the next poll, 3,600 uh, respondents. Uh, which of the following do you think will save your life in the event of a crash? Uh, bigger cars like an SUV, only 5% of people said that. But you would be surprised by the number of people 
who buy pickup trucks and uh, Humvees and other large SUVs so that they will be protected in the event of a crash. Now, uh, wearing a seatbelt, 75% of people believe that wearing a seatbelt will save them in the event of a crash, which is true, but it's only true up to about 50 miles an hour. After uh, 50 miles an hour, after 80 kilometers an hour, the benefits and the p uh, potential life-saving possibility of seatbelts reduces exponentially for every 5 to 10 miles an hour that you go over 50 miles an hour. Uh, airbags, advanced driver training skills. And I would argue that the number one <laughs> thing that is going to reduce your chances of being involved in a crash is advanced driver training skills i.e. the smarter defensive driving, keeping space around your vehicle and calm awareness. This is the one that I love the best. Uh, 3,200 votes. Which driving condition do you think are the most dangerous and lead to the highest number of crashes? 65% of respondents. Winter, snow, and ice. <laughs> uh, heavy fog and rain. Uh, night driving. This is actually the respondents and the myth and the belief of uh, people that responded to this poll, it, this is actually in the reverse order of actually what it is. It's actually number one is sunny dry roads and moderate traffic. Uh, number two is night driving. Number three is uh, fog and heavy rain. And the last one is winter snow and ice. Because in the winter time, people are, winter time and fog and heavy rain, people are actually paying attention. Yes, it's challenging to drive in these conditions, but people are paying attention, maintaining their space from other vehicles, and reducing their speed. That's why there aren't as many fatal crashes as there are on sunny dry roads and moderate traffic in the summertime. And then today I asked the question and I upset people because I took the poll and put it into a question and it says, which driving conditions are the most dangerous and lead to the highest number of crashes? And it's interesting only 39% because obviously a lot of people are, are um, guessing at the answer because they want to get the answer right. Again, 42%, and I would argue that it's probably higher than that. It's 50% of believe, people believe that the most dangerous conditions that lead to the highest number of crashes, winter, snow, and ice, which is not true. It's actually clear days, dry roads, and moderate traffic on secondary and tertiary roads, June, July, and August in the Northern Hemisphere. So I just wanted to try and clear some of that up for you and dispel some of the myths around driving <laughs> because people definitely have some myths and think that they are going to die in the winter time, which is not true. All right. Uh, Roy, uh, your exposure therapy helped me out a lot. I had to be patient with myself. I paid for professional lessons because I couldn't uh, learn with the family members. That's a possibility. Friends are good too. Yes, indeed, my fa my friend. Uh, you know, sometimes you just got to pay for people with driving instruction and other people that can help you out. Uh, friends and family are awesome. You know, they love us to death, but sometimes they're not the people that are going to take us down the path that we need to go to get to the goals that we want to achieve, right? Okay, uh, Colton, if you can see Abe Lincoln's head clear as day on a penny, you should replace them by now. Uh, okay, so there's another conversation I'm missing here. Uh, Sergeant, yeah, I hate those morons whom are too close in your rear. It's exhausting leading with them. Yes, indeed. Okay, Amy, uh, there's been a single lane between Port Alberni and the main highway. Lots of impatient drivers. Absolutely. Uh, elevator, when you go through yellow lights, uh, put your foot over the brake just in case someone cuts you off. Yes, we would like to think that people would do that elevator fan, but the number of drivers that I hear accelerating, <laughs> and I mean flat out accelerating on the gas pedal uh, as they're going through yellow lights to try and beat that yellow light is just probably uh, the majority of drivers who are trying to beat the yellow light. Okay, um... Uh, uh, retired, I have 47,000 km or 47,000 miles on my tires. Should I replace them? Uh, retired, are they down to the wear bars yet? And what is the age of the tires? Because uh, if you look at the video with Gary, uh, tires have a shelf life of about eight years now. So if they're older than eight years and they're getting down near the wear tire, the wear bars, I would suggest you do. Now, if you don't know anything about tires, as some people don't, and I'm not. That's not a a dig at you at all. 
uh, I would simply take it to a tire shop and get them to inspect them for you because they will be able to give you the best information by simply looking at the tires. I can only kind of give you general information about down to the wear bars and the age of the tires and whatnot. Uh, but a, 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 uh, um, a tire shop is going to be able to give you much better information by looking at your vehicle. Uh, Big Mac Sam, it's the ladder, my friend. It's S-T-R-I-K-E-R. -E He's right here. <laughs> he just walked past me. Uh, Michael, I've been practicing a lot for my driver's test in the week, next week. Uh, Michael, you are going to do awesome, my friend. Uh, Corey's put up the video for you on tires there, and that will help you out. Uh, Roy, I got to head out. Thank you. Safe driving, my friends, and thank you so much for showing up, my friend. That is awesome. Uh, Pierce, okay, excellent. Uh, Colton, the majority of accidents happen on those secondary and tertiary roads at night. Not during the day, but that's in rural areas. I don't know about cities and other similar conditions. Actually, Colton, uh, you are four times more likely to have a fatal crash at night. However, the number of fatal crashes that happen in the day and happen at night are about equal. Okay, so you're more likely to have a fatal crash at night, but the number of crashes that happen day and night is about the same and I would argue that the reason for that in the summertime is due to the fact that we have longer days so you know the Sun especially where I live here in the interior of British Columbia uh, we have longer days and the Sun comes up at 4 30 in the morning and it doesn't go down until 10 30 at night so there's longer daytime hours and this is the reason that we have the same number of crashes at day and at night uh, Sergeant, there are simulators which can help you to lose fear and anxiety. There's a game called Car City Car Driving. It's pretty good. Uh, yeah, and that's another possibility. That's not something that I had ever thought about, but definitely playing video games can definitely help with your anxiety and fear around driving if you experience that. And again, I would counsel you to work with a driving instructor, especially driving instructors that have that kind of experience working with older drivers and whatnot. Uh, that, all of that will help you out. <laughs> Big Mac Sam. Yeah, I already have a son uh, whose name is Byrne, B-H-Y-R-N. That's going to be misspelled for the rest of his life. Uh, so I didn't uh, go with the Y in Striker. I just called him the regular S-T-R-I-K-E-R, which is going to make it a little easier for people and whatnot. Uh, Colton, good night, my friend. All the best. Uh, Pierce, yeah, Rick. Accidents, which I was experiencing to deal with, but as a passenger, I was. Okay. Uh, elevator fan, I've seen drivers block the left lane, which can cause accidents. Yes, indeed. <laughs> left lane squatters. We just love to hate them here at Smart Drive Test. Uh, Mallory is a smart passenger. Every time I'm on the road with my parents, I think of all the things I've learned from Smart Drive Test, and that is awesome. It's always good to have passengers in the vehicle that are helping you to drive and monitoring things that are going on around uh, the vehicle and whatnot. Uh, Jay, have a great night, my friend. All the best. Uh, Amy, thank you for your information and videos. I think I'm ready. I just got to get my 16-year-old to practice driving. <laughs> yes, that is another challenge, getting your uh, teenagers out to practice. And uh, kudos, uh, congratulations to all the parents that are helping their kids to learn how to drive, getting them out in the vehicle, practicing in different conditions, getting them in different vehicles uh, on their learners and those types of things, paying for driving instructors uh, and lessons and whatnot. You know, just my hat's off to you because it's it's a tough job because they're your kids and, uh, you know, they're freaking out and whatnot. So, yeah, all, all the best. Uh, elevator fan, I've never seen anyone flash their brights or honk their horn at left lane squatters. Uh, you know, go for a drive with Tracy in the Audi. You will see her flash lights and honk horns. Uh, Marion, thank you for your live stream tonight. You need to rest. Uh, you look tired tonight. I do. I look tired. Oh, interesting. I've had a couple of days off. Maybe it's because of the fact that I'm finally sleeping because uh, my son is with his mom for the month of July and my daughter is at summer camp in Quebec. So i am actually got a bit of time by myself. So I'm actually getting a bit of sleep and whatnot. Uh, retired. The tires are three years old. The original tires and the tire shop has not recommended a change. Okay. So if they're only three years old retired, and they got 47,000 K on them, I think you're probably pretty good uh, because most tires now are good for about 60,000 miles. If you're noticing any unusual wear or uh, they're down to the wear bars, 
Uh, if you don't know what wear bars are, just Google wear bars. Essentially, it's the tread, the groove of the tread, and then there's a little piece of rubber underneath there. You can see it every... Uh, it's going to be in it at intervals around the tire itself, and the, as long as it's not down to the wear bars, you're going to be just fine, my friend, if, especially if they're only three years old. So, uh, awesome. Uh Pierce, while driving, dri does drivers drivers always make excuses? I make excuses, <laughs> but I make excuses when I drive as well. So anyway, all right, uh, excellent. Thank you everybody for your great questions. Uh, thank you for participating in the Smart Driver community, asking questions, making these live streams just absolutely awesome. Uh, Amy, yes, new video coming out tomorrow. I've shot it today and I'm hoping I'm gonna get it uh, edited tomorrow morning, so we'll get that going. Uh, Mallory, I'm not able to drive because of my very low vision, so my parents are my drivers, but, uh, you know, excellent uh, amount of information, Mallory, that you've, uh, you're able to uh, impart to your parents and help to keep them safe. So, yes, so new video tomorrow, uh, five tips to drive safer on two-lane two lane skinnies, as they're called in the truck driving industry, but two lanes opposing traffic. Uh, Striker, can you bring the dog in here for a minute? <laughs> come here come here striker come no come here silly you're supposed to come here there he is ah there's the dick can you look up there no you're looking over there because you're outside <laughs> all right thanks so much for tuning in all the very best uh if you have a driver's test in the last couple of weeks and you passed uh congratulations on passing awesome uh, if you have a driver's test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now. Is Alex driving you nuts? Hmm?